Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-karim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, including the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you on this, the fifth day of the month of Safar in the year 1446 from here in Al Hidayah, in Wang Samaju in Kuala Lumpur, with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. That to Ku Jafar Ku Sha'ari and brothers and sisters, I am very happy to be invited to address you this morning on this important topic. But there are two topics. So I'm going to have to address the first one and then find a way to connect to the second one. We are supposed to look at the current situation in Gaza towards the emergence of a new Islamic political and economic power block. But I am an Islamic eschatologist. I specialize in the Quran and the end time. Although I have credentials in political science and economics and monetary economics, my essential address is going to be on eschatology. So we're going to look at Gaza from the perspective of Islamic eschatology. And when we do so, we want to begin with the Quran because Allah says about the Quran, I don't know how many people know it, but Allah says about the Quran, Ba'adawuzu billahi min shaitani rajim, He says, Wa innahu la haqqul yakin, that in this book, there is absolute truth. So absolute truth is not with the government of Malaysia. Absolute truth is not with the king of Malaysia. Absolute truth is not with the New Straits Times. No. Absolute truth is not with any university. No. Absolute truth is in the book of Allah. But our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, he complained. He complained to Allah. And he complained to Allah about us and our relationship with the Quran. And that complaint is located in the Quran. In Surah Al Furqan. Listen to the complaint. Ba'ad a'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Ba'qad ar-rasul. And the messenger of Allah said, Ya Rabb, O my Lord God, inna qawmi takhazu haza al-Qur'an mahjura. My people, my people, have forsaken this Qur'an. They go everywhere else for guidance, but they don't come to the Qur'an. <laughs> My people have forsaken this Qur'an. My people have betrayed the Qur'an. This is Surah Al-Furqan. And that complaint is valid today. Because I am 
older perhaps than all of you present, and I have traveled extensively in my life, and I have served the mission of Islam all over the world, and I tell you, the condition of this Ummah, insofar as its relationship with the Quran is concerned, is pathetic. So with that ominous warning, let us turn to the Quran to look at Gaza. And we turn to Surah to Surah to Isra. I'm happy to see those who have a pen and paper and take notes because when I was a student, I used to do that myself. بَعَلَوْزَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ And we ordained for the Israelite people, it is written for them, that they will be wicked in their conduct in the Holy Land on two occasions. Oh, but both these occasions already occurred before the Quran was revealed. So what about what's happening now? Why does the Quran say twice when there are three? Allah sent the Qur'an لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ People who think and that very famous scholar of Islam who lived a hundred years ago, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal whose profile of scholarship dazzles, dazzles me. He said that the world of Islam stopped thinking 500 years ago. And in my old age, I agree with him. We stopped thinking. So now then, why does the Quran say that the Israelite people will commit facade in the land twice when there are three times? When we think, then we get the answer. That the Quran is speaking of facade committed by the Israelite people, Banu Israel. And that will happen twice. So this one is not there because this one is not Banu Israel. It's someone else. So who are those who are now committing what looks like genocide? I hesitate to declare genocide as yet. Who are those who control power in Israel? And who want to wipe out the Palestinians, both Christians and Muslims? Who are they? Banu Israel are a people who have come from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam through his son Ishaq alayhi salam, Isaac, and from Isaac through his son Yaqub, Jacob alayhi salam. But the Arabs have also come from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham, to his son Ismail alayhi salam, Ismail. So the Israelite people and the Arabs are cousins. Cousins. They have the same DNA. But those who control power in Israel today, they don't have that DNA. 
they're not descended from Ibrahim or Salam. Who are they? They are a European people. Your prime minister in Israel today was born in Poland. <laughs> Most, nine out of every ten in Israel today came from the Soviet Union and from Eastern Europe. They're all European people. And so they are not Banu Israel. Number two, after Allah sent the Messiah in the person of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, the son of the Virgin Maryam, some of them accepted him and the rest of them rejected him. When they saw, he listened carefully, so no one makes a fool of themselves. Listen to my words. When they saw him die on the cross, when they saw him die on the cross. Now, did I say he died on the cross? Did I say that? Did I say that? <laughs> ah, yes. When they saw him die on the cross, some of them were weeping. And these are people who subsequently now, Allah no longer refers to them as Banu Israel. In the Quran, Allah stops using the term Banu Israel. And he now refers to these people as an Nasara. They can call themselves Christians if they want, but Allah calls them an Nasara. What is the meaning of an Nasara? Nabi Isa Islam asks, Man Ansari ilallah. Who will help me in the cause of Allah? So, and Nasara are a people who will help the cause of Allah. That is how Allah named them. And those who celebrated when they saw him with their eyes, they saw him die on the cross. They were now called Al Yahud. And these two combined are now known as Ahlul Kitab. So the term Banu Israel is no longer used. Because large numbers of people will now join this ground, the Christian world, who are not Israelites. <laughs> and nine out of ten in this group would not be Israelites, they be Europeans. This is why Allah no longer uses the term Banu Israel in the Quran after the crucifixion. But of course, you and I know that he was not crucified. You and I know that Allah made it appear like that. And you and I know that this is foolishness. I wish I knew the Bahasa word for garbage. <laughs> that, that Allah caused someone to assume the appearance of Jesus. And that innocent man was crucified. This came from a garbage bin. So let's throw it back into the garbage bin. It is unjust also, sinful, because you are attributing to Allah an act which is unjust. What was the explanation? What happened? That Allah made it appear that he was crucified 
when he was not. You must read my book, which is there, The Messiah, the Quran, and Akhir Zaman. So now then, these are people who are not Banu Israel, and they are committing facade in the Holy Land now. They are massacring the, the Palestinian people, Jew, Christians as well as Muslims. So who are they? Who are these European people? Answer, the same people who control power in Israel are the same wicked people who control power in modern Western civilization. They are the same wicked people who created the International Monetary Fund. Be careful if you want to challenge me on that subject because I have done my homework. So who are these wicked people? who control power in modern Western civilization and who are waging war on Islam for a long time now and who are also waging war on the Orthodox Christian world. There are two, type, two kinds of Christians. There are those Christians who try to follow Jesus and today, Russia is leading that world of Christianity. And there's another Christian world which celebrates the birth of Jesus on the 25th of December. But when you look at that birthday party on Christmas Day for Jesus, you can't find him because they have replaced him with a fellow called Santa Claus. They follow Santa Claus. And if you want to join them, then go your way and leave us alone. Have I spoken clearly? Go your way and leave us alone, because we the Ummah which follows Muhammad and that Ummah which follows Jesus, we have an alliance to build and we're going to build it and you cannot stop us. So who are those wicked people who now control power in Israel and are committing what they're doing in Gaza? and who also control power in Washington and in London and in Paris. Does the Quran answer us? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You hardly ever find me using the term Hamas. You hardly ever use use the term Taliban. You hardly ever hear me using the term Houthi. <laughs> I don't use these terms. Like you'll never ask, hear me talking about how many kids do you have? Huh? What did you say? I know that only goats and Americans have kids. The rest of us have children. So I'm not a slave of these people who coin their nasty language and I slavishly follow them. And so now, Allah speaks in the Quran about the last stage, Akhiru Zaman. 
And our Prophet Allah's blessing be upon him spoke about Gog and Magog. Yeah, Juj and Ma Juj. And if you have five ringgits worth of common sense, that's all, you would know. That if Allah has spoken of Gog and Magog in the Quran, and you want to study this subject, the first place to go to study this subject is the Quran. If you have five ringgits worth of intelligence, you would know that since the Quran is absolute truth, the Hadith is not absolute truth, then when you have studied the Quran, the Quran will now sit in judgment over the Hadith. A Hadith cannot contradict the Quran. A Hadith cannot destroy what is in the Quran. No. But it appears that there are many today who don't have even five ringgits worth of common sense. My language is harsh, but I've earned the credentials to speak harshly because I've served the mission of Islam for 25, 30 years, consistently teaching and lecturing and traveling all over the world. So I have the right to speak harshly when I speak harshly now. So what does the Quran say about Gog and Magog? I have a book there on the subject. The Quran speaks of Gog and Magog as human beings. Not some creatures living in the interior of the earth. That qualifies as nonsense. And the Quran speaks of them as evil people. Evil beings. You can't change them. And they are people who commit wickedness and who corrupt everything they touch and destroy. But the Quran also goes on to say that Allah destroyed a town and expelled the people of the town and then placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own until Gog and Magog are released and then with their indestructible power, this is Sahih Muslim, indestructible power, not even the Malaysian armed forces can destroy them, indestructible power, they will spread out all over the world and take control of power in the world. And then they will bring these people back to that town so which town is it? Unless you think you would know the answer. And Allah sent the Quran to people who think. And when I lecture and I teach and I travel, I'm a fisherman fishing for students who have a capacity for critical thinking, for independent thinking not being gramophone records of others. So which town is it? The answer is, does, does, is there any town which is connected to Gog and Magog, either in the Quran or the Hadith? And the answer is yes. Our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, said that Gog and Magog will be destroyed by Allah in Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So it's very easy for us to conclude that the town is Jerusalem. So what the Quran is saying about Gog and Magog is that Allah destroyed Jerusalem, that Allah expelled the Israelite people from Jerusalem that Allah placed a ban on them, those who rejected the Messiah, 
that they could never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own until Gog and Magog have been released. And when they are released, they will spread out all over the world and take control of power in the world. And they will then bring these people back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. Have the Jews been returned? Have the Jews returned to Jerusalem as yet? Are they in Jerusalem now? <laughs> Have they taken control of Jerusalem? Who brought them back? If you know who brought them back, you can identify Gog and Magog. Answer? It is modern Western civilization. So the profile of modern Western civilization includes in it that this is the civilization of Gog and Magog. Do you know any Islamic scholar in Malaysia or in Indonesia or in Brunei who has declared that Gog and Magog are those who control power in the modern Western world? Is there anyone? None. That's the state. That is the state of Islamic scholarship in this country. What I have done is fairly simple analysis. But the mistake is they go to the Hadith and they betray the Quran. And when they go to the Hadith, the Hadith says that when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, when he comes back, and Dajjal has killed Nabi Isa alayhi salam, which has not happened yet, then Allah will send Gog and Magog. Allah will send Gog and Magog. Not really send. And they will surround him at a mountain in Jerusalem. <laughs> and he will pray to Allah and Allah will send something which will attack them at the top of the spine. And they'll all fall down paralyzed by next morning. They're all dead. They follow that hadith and they misunderstand that hadith and they come to the conclusion Gog and Magog will only come to the world after Jesus has returned and he has killed the child, so let's go home and eat our roti tonight. That is your Islamic scholarship today. And it is pathetic. If those who control power in Gaza, uh, sorry, in Israel, and who are perpetrating what they're doing in Gaza today, if they are Gog and Magog, does the Islamic resistance that call themselves Hamas, do they know that? Huh? <laughs> the answer is no. If you do not know who is your enemy, how can you respond to him? Is it possible for the Islamic resistance in Gaza to defeat Israel? That's the question. You can offer your political analysis. You can offer your military and security analysis, strategic analysis. We offer the analysis from the Quran. And our answer is no, you cannot defeat them and destroy them. Yes, they can when they see that they are facing a public relation disaster, they can decide to retreat as they did in Vietnam, as they did in Afghanistan. But that was not defeat in the sense of military defeat. That is a public relations defeat. So is it possible for the Islamic resistance in Gaza to defeat Israel? The answer is no. 
because Allah says about Gog and Magog, I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. Not even Zulkarnain. And Zulkarnain was ordained by Allah with power to do whatever he wants to do. But he could not destroy them. So that's why he built the barrier. So what happened last October, in hindsight, would now appear to have been a mistake. The attack on Israel that took place on October the 7th appears to have been a trap set by Israel and Saudi Arabia combined. But I don't want to speak further on the subject. I want you to be able to think and use your insight. All I have said is it appears that Israel and Saudi Arabia combined to set a trap and the Islamic resistance walked into the trap. So now then, what should be done? The Islamic resistance in, this, in Gaza, they are a people who follow the Hizb al-Tahrir, which is a Palestinian movement. But Hizb al-Tahrir does not have an eschatology. No, <laughs> I've studied them. And without the knowledge of eschatology, how can you deal with Israel? What the Islamic resistance now has to do is to correct the mistake that they made last October and formulate a strategy to deal with Israel which is similar to that of Zulkarnain. What did Zulkarnain do? He built a barrier, a barrier built of blocks of iron and then covered with molten copper. And Gog and Magog could neither penetrate nor scale the barrier. Today, it is for you to think, what kind of a barrier do we need to build to protect ourselves from Gog and Magog in Gaza? I can't answer that question from Kuala Lumpur. I am not in Gaza. What kind of a political barrier must be built? What kind of an economic barrier must be built? What kind of a monetary barrier must be built, what kind of a social barrier must be built, what kind of a moral barrier must be built. The Islamic resistance has to search and locate that barrier that has to be built. If you are to follow in the footsteps of Zulkarnain in order to be able to move forward in Gaza, and that's all that I have to say on the subject of Gaza. I know I've whetted your appetite and there's more you want to hear from me, but I'm going to restrain myself from speaking further on the subject. We now turn to the emergence of an Islamic political and economic power block. And I want to amend the subject. A political and economic power block in Akhiru Zaman. And we want to again repeat what we said earlier, that the world of Islam must make a choice. 
either to remain faithful to absolute truth in the Quran or to betray it. Make your choice. If the choice is to remain faithful to absolute truth in the Quran, then we want to commence by saying that the road forward towards political and economic progress for this Ummah at this time lies beginning, the first thing lies in monetary cooperation with Russia and China. What do I mean by monetary cooperation? We'll turn to political and e economic affairs later. What do I mean by monetary, or, or, uh, uh, monetary cooperation? And the road forward for this Ummah um, uh, requires us to extricate ourselves from the embrace, the monetary embrace of modern Western civilization. This alone we could take me one hour to deal with this. So I'm going to have to touch the mountain tops and hope that you will do the homework yourself. The modern Western world has embraced all of mankind with a venomous monetary embrace, which is largely built on the International Monetary Fund. And the road forward, I speak to your Prime Minister now, I know your Prime Minister, the road forward for this Ummah requires us to extricate this Ummah from the embrace of the International Monetary Fund. Only one leader in the world of Islam, only one, since the time of decolonization to this day, ever had the integrity and the courage to call a spade a spade and declare, I'm taking my country out of the IMF. And today, Malaysia will say he was a fool. Who is the fool? He or Malaysia? Huh? And don't talk about Indonesia, because Indonesia has forgotten Ahmad Sukarno now. Indonesia has more important things to think about than Ahmad Sukarno. He's the only one. Remember, be careful when you challenge me, because I have done my homework. He's the only one. When Indonesia became an independent state, in the 1950s, I think, he, he called the ulama. I don't think Tanko Abdurrahman ever did that, or would ever do such a thing. But Ahmad Sukarno called the ulama. And he asked them, what is the status of this money that the Dutch has left us when they decolonize the Indonesian rupiah? The ulama replied to him and to the credit of Indonesian Islamic scholarship, mashallah. And they said to him that this money would be halal, provided that it functioned the way a check functions. A check means it's a promissory note. And if you cash the check, you'll get the money. And if you cash the check and you don't get the money, somebody's going to jail. So this rupiah would be halal on the condition that you can cash it for money. And money, of course, Indonesia knew it. Money in the Quran is a dinar. The word dinar is in the Quran. 
and you don't believe me, check it out. The word dirham is in the Quran, but in the plural. And the dinar in the Quran is a gold coin. And the dirham in the Quran is a silver coin. So the ulama said to Ahmad Sukarno, if the rupiah is, the technical term is redeemable, if the rupiah can be redeemed in gold and silver, then it is halal. But it has to be at a fixed rate, not a rate which changes with every passing cloud. Because that's bogus. There's no integrity in that money. It has to be a fixed rate so that it can store. S T O R E. It can store value. So if Allah puts you to sleep for 300 years, eh? and you had some money in your pocket, and with this money you could buy some roti chanai. After 300 years when you wake up, the money could still buy the food. Because the money has successfully stored its value. So Ahmed Sukarno said then, in that case, tell me what is the rate. And they suggested a rate for him. It doesn't have to be any special rate. Anyone can be chosen. And because he was going to work towards establishing that kind of a monetary system, similar to what Muammar Gaddafi was attempting in Libya before they got rid of him. That's why they said, this man has to go. And then the CIA went to work, and they took some time to get rid of Ahmad Sukarno. Ahmad Sukarno said, when he understood the subject, that this monetary system which has come from the West was evil. Has Malaysia ever woken up as yet to come to that conclusion? When will Malaysia wake up? He came to the conclusion that the monetary system which had come from the West was evil. And he decided to take Indonesia out of the IMF. And I have come today to tell you that the road forward for establishing an Islamic and economic, political and economic power block lies in extricating this ummah from the venomous em embrace of the IMF. And I hope these words will reach your Prime Minister. He knows me and I know him. If Allah makes something halal and you make it haram, what sin is that? Surah to Tawbah of the Quran says that is shirk. And shirk is a sin that Allah will not forgive. Allah made dinar halal. Yes, it's in the Quran. The articles of the agreement of the International Monetary Fund has made dinar haram. And Dr. Mahathir was not aware of that before he retired. To his credit, Dr. Mahathir was attempting, no one else in this country has attempted. Dr. Mahathir was attempting something that no one else in this country has ever attempted. No one else seemed to have the courage to even attempt it. Dr. Mahathir was trying to build a little edge, a little ledge to bring back integrity to money. That's what he's trying. I don't need to spend time to explain to you, because you're a Malaysian. You know what he was trying to do before he retired. And then <laughs> his successor, whose name I will not mention, but who graduated from Al-Azhar University, took it 
and threw it into the garbage bin. If Allah made dinar halal and the International Monetary Fund has prohibited the use of dinar and money, they make it haram, haram then that is shirk. And all of us who accept it, and all of us who are now comfortable with that monetary system, and who look down at Ahmad Sukhan, he's a fool. All of us are now in shirk. And so we should not be surprised on Judgment Day when we are told that we have died in shirk and we're going to be thrown into the hellfire because we deserve it. We deserve it. The road forward, therefore, for a political and economic power block in the world of Islam begins with resisting the monetary imperialism of the IMF. Who is challenging that imperialism today? Answer, communist China. But communism hardly exists in China anymore today. <laughs> it's just a name now. China is actually a businessman. And he's a very astute businessman. And China has the largest economy in the world today, larger than the... American economy. And China is challenging the monetary system around the world today. And it's because China is leading the way, that is why Russia could stand with China. Because Russia has now become, by Allah's kindness and grace, the most powerful military power in the world today. And who don't like that can take it and put it in their pipe and smoke it. Russia is today the most powerful military force in the world, and that's why Maduro is still in power in Venezuela. The, the alliance of Russia and China represents the first significant threat to the dominance of modern Western civilization. And there is a second alliance coming. With my book, I wrote a book, I'm finishing it now, entitled The Quran and Russia's Destiny. This book is written at the request of Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. When that book is written, you will see the arguments I've raised. That there is a second alliance coming that will challenge that monetary dominance of the West. And that is an alliance of the Ummah of Muhammad who followed Nabi and who are faithful to the Quran, and the Ummah of Nabi Isa who followed Jesus. The second alliance is coming. The first alliance was given to the world something called BRICS. And BRICS today has made considerable success already in challenging the dominance of the US dollar and the petrodollar. And there are some actors on the stage of the world who are playing a mysterious game. And you have to be careful with these uh, mysterious actors. One of them is Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, prophesied amongst the prophecies of Akhir Zaman. He said that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold, meaning a mountain of gold will come out from underneath the river. A mountain must be higher than this platform, eh? A mountain has to be higher than this building, eh? Am I correct? That's a mountain. 
So if you collect one kilogram of gold from the riverbed, that doesn't qualify as a mountain. Eh? A mountain of gold will un uncover from the river Euphrates, and people will fight for that gold. And 99 out of, every one, out of every 100 who fight for that goal would be killed. And each would say he was the one who's going to, to survive. Each one of them would say. But the believers must not touch that goal. Oh, but gold is halal. Dinar is halal. So what is it that why we must not touch that gold? There are some verses of the Quran which are called Ayat Muhkamat. They are plain and clear, and you don't need to interpret them. And this is the heart of the Quran. But there are other verses of the Quran, like a shadow which will appear with three parts which cannot be understood literally. You have to interpret them to understand it. And they're called Ariyat Mutashabihat. The Hadith is like that as well. So those who want to wait for a mountain of gold to come out from underneath the river, I say find a comfortable sofa <laughs> to sit down because you have a long wait. We choose to believe that this is not Muhkama. This is Mutashabiha. And it has to be interpreted to be understood. It's not a literal mountain of the metal. We say no. We say that when the war took place in 1973, and King Faisal Rahimahullah imposed an oil boycott on the United States. The Americans knew he was going to do that, and they wanted him to do that. Because two years earlier, in 1971, Charles de Gaulle's France had brought down the monetary system. I don't have the time to explain this monetary history to you. They got rid of Charles de Gaulle, but his successors continued to demand that US dollars be redeemed for gold at $35 an ounce. And Nixon realized the house of cards will collapse. So in September 1971, Nixon said, we gave our word but well, we don't have to keep our word. And so the United States reneged on its obligation under international law to redeem US dollars for gold at the rate of $35 an ounce. And since then, the US dollar was in no man's land. It could collapse. And that's why they wanted the war to take place in 1973 and they wanted Faisal to impose the oil boycott on the United States because what happened was the price of oil went up by 400%. And the US dollar collapsed in value by 400%. That's bogus money, of course. That's what happened to bogus money. So then Faisal went to Saudi Arabia and met with Faisal. Sorry, Kissinger went and met with Faisal and pulled off the greatest scam history has ever known. He said to Faisal, we will guarantee your safety and you'll also get far more income than what you're getting now. You have to do only one thing, and that is you must not sell your oil for anything else but the US dollar. S skillful, cunning man. Kissinger. And Faisal, because he didn't have anything more than peanuts in his head, like all politicians, <laughs> he accepted it. And that's how the petrodollar was born. 
And when the petrodollar was born in 1974, an ocean of oil underneath the river began to function as a mountain of gold. An ocean of oil underneath the river began to function as a mountain of gold. And then since 1974, the United States and the Western world have grown even more wealthy than they were before. Their wealth is now multiplying because of this foolishness of Faisal and the birth of the petrodollar. And the poor of the world are descending into destitution and slavery to such an extent that we now have an avalanche of economic refugees. But those who live in the comfort zone, they don't care for that. But there are others who can see that slavery is descending upon most of mankind. And people are suffering destitution and slavery, living in an economic desert. And there is no way out other than to try to get onto a boat and flee to, to, to Greece or to Bulgaria and to make your way with great, 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 great hardship. Our people, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, economic refugees, and Trump says the way to solve it, build a wall. <laughs> build a wall, says Trump. At the elections which just took place in Britain, the elections which are taking place in the United States, the election that took place just now in France, in all of these, number one on the table is immigration. There are riots taking place in Britain now because of the avalanche of refugees descending upon the West. Why? Because the mountain, the, the, the ocean of oil underneath the river has been functioning as a mountain of gold for them and their bogus monetary system is functioning as a vacuum pump, sucking the wealth of mankind. And they're getting richer, and our people descending into poverty and destitution. What will Allah do to those who, who turn a blind eye to what is happening in the world today? And so when the Prophet said, when this happens, when that mountain of gold comes out from underneath the river, people will fight for the gold. And 99 out of every 100 will be killed. That's where we are today. Because China, to its credit, China has led the resistance to this monetary imperialism. And if you can't see that, go back to school. If you have so much hostility in your heart for China, go back to school. Because China has led the way in resisting this monetary injustice and imperialism in the world today. And Russia is standing with, in, with China in bricks. And guess who is there with them? India. <laughs> Hindu India. But Hindu India is not doing it because of politics of integrity. It's politics of expediency. That's Hindu India. And, and South Africa. And Brazil. And where is the world of Islam? Where is this emerging political and economic power block? Did we play any part at all? in building an alternative to resist the monetary imperialism of the West. We have not done it. They have done it. So if there is a road forward for monetary freedom for us, it is in supporting BRICS. 
in the future. We turn now to the banking system and the Islamic economy and the road forward. I have an hour and a half given to me, but I need about three hours. Why has Allah prohibited money being lent and borrowed on interest? Why has he done it? In Surah 2, where is it? Surah to Hashar, which is Surah number 59, Allah speaks about the distribution of wealth. Some of it to these people, some to those, some to those, some to those, break it up. And then he explains why. He says, K. لا يكون الدولة بين الأغنياء منكم. He says, I do not want that wealth should circulate only amongst the wealthy. Islam has come to the world to give a different kind of economy. What the Western world has done through the banking system and through other means as well, but the banking system plays an important role in it, is to deliver an economy which is now universal around the world, in which wealth now circulates only amongst the wealthy. And the poor are condemned to remain permanently poor. So when government sees this, and you know government have to be slaves of the West, otherwise they'll topple you, called color revolution. So the government, the state must now intervene in the economy to try to see if they could redistribute some wealth. In this country, it happened. You also have to have something shameful, disgraceful, sinful, called minimum wage legislation. You have to put a cap on prices, Roti Chennai, this is the fixed price. Tetarik, this is the fixed price. So that the poor will not descend into slavery. If you do not intervene in the economy to fix prices and to let the state transfer resources to some people, then what is going to happen is the pot is going to boil and boil and boil until eventually the cover will be thrown out and revolution will take place. It was biting poverty in Bangladesh which led to that revolt. So it's time for us to go back to Nabi Muhammad Islam. A man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Impose price control. The Prophet said, no. For us, that's enough. We would not go back to him. But he went back a second time. O Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Impose price control. The Prophet said no for a second time. The man came back a 
third time and said, O messenger of Allah, prices are too high, impose price control. The Prophet said, no. But we can pray to Allah to bring down prices. So, Islam gives to the world a free and a fair market in which prices are determined by the market and not by anyone else. That is a free and fair market. And today we no longer have a free and a fair market because unless there is government intervention in the market, which of course is socialism, unless there is government intervention in the market for the redistribution of wealth, as has happened in Malaysia, unless you have minimum wage legislation, the pot is going to boil over and there's going to be bloody revolution. What does the banking system do to prevent wealth from circulating through the economy? Around the world today, wealth no longer circulates through the economy. Around the world today, wealth circulates amongst the wealthy. The rich are permanently rich and the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty. The answer is that the Quran has explained the riba or borrowing and lending money and in interest does not qualify as business. Allah says, وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ وَحَرَّمَ riba." Allah has made business halal, but he's made riba haram, your banking system. Why does moral money being borrowed and lent on interest, why does it not qualify as business? Answer. A business transaction in order to qualify as a business transaction must involve the element, the possibility of loss. You can make a profit or you can suffer a loss. That is business. The definition of a business transaction is that you have the possibility of either a profit or a loss. That is the definition of a business transaction. But money being lent on interest by the bank is not a business transaction. Why? The bank immunizes itself from loss. Allah says you cannot reap if you don't plant. Allah says, وَأَلَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى you cannot reap unless you plant. The only person who can reap without planting is the bank. Because the bank says, we will reap, let all the donkeys do the planting, we will do the reaping. Because when money is lent on interest, the bank ensures that there is no possibility of loss. It tries to immunize itself as much as it possible from loss. When that happens, then Allah says, it is Allah's function when you do business and you embrace risk, R-I-S-K, that Allah can take from some and give to others. So one day for me and one day for you. And Allah can cause wealth to circulate through the economy. That is a healthy economy. But when you shut the door, which is what riba does, Allah says, I will not change your condition. No until you make the effort to change your own condition. And so a 
transaction on riba does not qualify as business. So once the economy is based on riba, wealth will no longer circulate through the economy. It is a, <laughs> it is a, I don't know what language to use, something worthy of a child. A child would behave like that. To say, we're going to give you Islamic banking, Islamic banking, no riba. But the economy is still based on riba. And you want to tell me that this is your response to it? Tell you Islamic banking, go back to school. You're unworthy of a people who have studied the Quran. This is why I'm not popular in Malaysia. Unless and until you take the bull by the horns and you're able to bring an economy in which wealth would circulate to the economy, your Islamic banking does nothing. It's peripheral and important. It's just window dressing. It makes no difference for building an Islamic economy that will be something that all of mankind could look at. With wonder, look at this economy. Look how healthy it is. Singapore can't be the model, not at all. So when, whenever we decide to take the bull by the horns and resist the, the banking system, which is forcing a change in the economy in such a way that wealth is circulating only amongst the wealthy. When we resist that and we bring a different economy in which wealth will circulate through the economy, now we are on the road to political and economic power block for the world of Islam. This was Surah Al-Hashar of the Quran and the verses we turn now to the economy. That was the, sorry, we turn first to the monetary system. We turn to the banking system. We don't have the time to go to the market except to say to you that what we have brought to the world is a free and a fair market with no government intervention in the market. It is the market which fixes prices and changes prices. And we now turn to the political role forward. Those who control power in the world today, based on our study of the Quran, are those who control power in modern Western civilization. And those who control power in modern Western civilization, they spread out all over the world, including here in what was known as Malaya. They are the ones who took Hong, Hong Kong away from China to make Hong Kong a bastion for the West. They are the ones, ones who took Singapore Singapore, away from this Nusantara, to make Singapore a bastion for the modern West. And they did this wickedness all over the world. And when they controlled power all over the world, then they brought the Jews back to Jerusalem after 2,000 years to recover Jerusalem as their own, to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land, and now that Israel wants to replace the United States of America. When we want to talk about politics and the way forward, we have to look at the movement of history, political history. Not just that an actor who never appeared on the stage of the world before 
suddenly comes on the stage of the world and takes control of power in the world. Modern Western civilization. But more than that, something is happening inside modern Western civilization that the Quran refers to in Surah to Surah to Mursalat, in Taliko Ila Zillin Zi Sada Sishab. Proceed to a shadow with three parts. And we say, inside of modern Western civilization, Pax Britannica appeared with a mysterious relationship with Jerusalem, like the Balfour Declaration, like General Allenby leading a British army into Jerusalem, Jerusalem in 1917. Today, the Crusades have ended. And then a Pax Britannica gave to the world the British pound as the union. The, the international currency, and London became the in financial capital of the world. And then came a Pax Americana, which replaced Pax Britannica. And the United States maintained that same mysterious obsession with Israel. Netanyahu just went after all the bloodbath in Gaza, and Netanyahu just went to the United States Congress, and the whole Congress welcomed him and clapped and applauded him with blood all over the place. They don't care. The United States continues what Britain did with this mysterious relationship with Israel. And now we say the third part of the shadow is coming. This is essential for understanding the way power forward in the political world. That the United States dollar is on its way out. And Trump can do what he wants. He cannot make America great again. The United States is a failing power and something is coming to replace it. We know what it is. Our prophet said he gave a timeline of events of Akhir Zaman. He said, when Jerusalem is center stage and Medina is in forlorn desolation. The next event that will occur will be the Great War, the nuclear war. He said, after the nuclear war, the next event to occur within seven months or seven years would be a Muslim army conquering and liberating Constantinople. And he praised the army and he praised the commander. And he said, after the conquest of Constantinople, the next event would be the appearance of Dajjal in person. So we have two timelines now. One, that a Pax Americana is about to be replaced by a Pax Judaica. I am perhaps the first scholar to make mention of this 20-something years ago in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran. And they laughed at me at that time. Nobody's laughing today. Israel is poised, waiting for the great war to take place and hoping that the great war will result in mutual destruction on both sides. And after the great war, the road will be clear for Israel to stake her claim for a Pax Judaica. And only when that occurs would Dajjal will now appear in person. But before that, the US dollar must go. So what will replace it? I have come back to Malaysia after eight years. I left eight years ago to find this country sleeping. Yes, not only sleeping, 
but dancing to every tune that the child plays. And I'm waiting to see where is that Malaysia which is awake. I'm looking for it to see where is that Malaysia which is awake and which is able to read what is happening in the world. I went to Penang and on my way back I stopped at Tapa and every single stall in Tapa had a sign preparing for cashless, preparing for cashless. Ah, oh, yes, the sheep and the cattle and the goats and the camels who have no knowledge, unaware that what Israel is going to do is that all the money in the world will disappear, including your ringgit. And there'll be only one universal currency. <laughs> and it'll be controlled by Israel. And you deserve the slavery which is now coming upon you because you're welcoming the cashless world because your banking system is, is brainwashing you. So that's Pax, Pax Judaica, monetary slavery coming. But our prophet has said that after the Great War, this Ummah will wake up. The emerging Islamic political power will only come after the Great War. Then the army will emerge. Oh, okay. The next, uh, the next speaker, my, my, my apologies to him, I thought I had an hour and a half. My hour and a half already up? Already up. I'm sorry about that. The, the Islamic power block will emerge only after the Great War because then the Muslim army will emerge which will liberate Constantinople. And when the Muslim army liberates Constantinople, you're preparing the way for Imam al-Mahdi to come. And then all of these states will disappear and the Khilafah state will return. That is the Islamic power block that's coming. The Khilafah state that is coming is led by Imam al-Mahdi, inshallah. And we will be in alliance with the Christians led by Russia. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.